Love it. So you, your job before you became, uh, you're a professor at Biola University now. Um, you, you're obviously a Christian apologist. But prior to that, and, and really the, your approach to Christianity um, is by way of being a detective, a homicide detective. And yeah. specifically, you worked with cold cases. Could you just give us a synopsis on your work as a cold case detective and how that shaped your thinking and how that still shapes your thinking today? Yeah, I sometimes will have people ask me, um, so why should I care what you think about this anyway? I mean, you probably get this online too. Like, who, who are we? Doesn't think we can, we're not the experts. Right, and if right. there's somebody out there who's a better expert in this area, then they're always going to say, well, I trust that guy instead of you. I get that. Um, I use experts all the time in trial. Uh, but both sides will bring in their own experts and they'll look at the exact same piece of evidence and they'll say the exact opposite things about that exact same piece of evidence and they're both got PhDs. Right. So I get all that. Um, my, my view is this, I worked cases in which I had no access to the eyewitnesses because they had died hmm. and I had no access to the, um, report writers in most of these cases because they had also died. I have some of the cases that are 35 years old. You know, if you're a 50 year old, um, uh, homicide detective, by the time I pick it up and you, if you're 85, <laughs> good, good for you. A lot of times you're not around anymore. And so now I've got to read a report in which I have no access to the witnesses and no access to the, uh, to the people who wrote these reports. Yet I'm supposed to try to figure out what really happened back there. And there's no statute of limitations on murder. Correct? No statute of limitations. So that's why these are so similar to, by the way, once everyone who saw this is dead, you're pretty much in the same place, whether it's 65 years ago or 665 years ago, you got to figure out how do I corroborate this? Now, of course, it's much easier when it's only 35 years ago. Because there might be people or, or events you could still access the information, right? You know, uh, was it a rainy day in, in uh, August 17th, 1979? I might be able to have some data on that. It would be harder to know if it was a rainy day, right, Back as far as, as the time of Jesus. But the approach is still similar enough that I just said, okay, I, I don't know how to assess this. I was 35 before I ever walked into church. And as I was presented with the gospel and presented with the person of Jesus, I knew I had to go out and buy a Bible to see if any of that stuff was true. And so I did. And then I had to work the Bible somehow. How do I investigate the claims of the Bible? Well, I, I knew a, I had a teacher in, in high school who was Baha'i. And he was, he was great because uh, I was very interested in Baha'u'llah, a remarkable um, story, really, on how he wrote his scripture. But these are all proverbial statements of wisdom. Like, imagine if all we had was the Gospel of Thomas, just the wise sayings of Jesus. Right. If all we had were all the Gospels are like Proverbs, you know, you open them up and here's Jesus, why is saying number one? Why is saying number two? Okay, that, that's very hard to assess whether or not any of this should be listened to. You might say, well, this feels good to me. But these are not objective claims about something that happened in history, okay? But that we were lucky. I opened the Gospels and I realized, wow, these are claims where people want me to actually believe that this stuff happened. Yeah. That's different. That's all my supplemental reports from 1980 you know, or 1975. So I started to look at these cases, uh, these uh, gospels, like a case book. And I just, you know, if you look at my, my walls back here, are filled with these fat under behind this microphone. Now on the bottom here, right down where my finger is touching right there, there's two really thick, uh, that's one of the homicides we, we worked, where we probably developed 2,000 pages of documents after we reopened it. I think I did something similar when I reopened the Gospels, and it's a cumulative case. Like every cold case I work, these are cumulative. So um, if there was a one smoking gun kind of thing, this would have got solved 35 years ago. But because there isn't, these are lame cases. These are cases you have to build death by a thousand paper cuts. That's what I do in these cases. I build them. It takes a long time. They are visual because it's easier to see the case visually when you paint it in front of a jury when you, you, know, print, you, you show it visually in front of a jury. Um, so most of my casework is visual. The books I write, I, I draw my own illustrations because I want to be able to make that case to the, to the reader um, the way I would in front of a jury. Um, so that's, that's, that's the approach I took with the Gospels. And after examining them to see if they were reliable eyewitness testimony, I, I came away with, okay, to the degree to which you could test anything this old, given the four aspects of reliability and eyewitnesses, right? Were they really there to see what they said they saw? Two, 
Can they be corroborated in some way? There's a number of ways to corroborate, and all corroboration is just a fraction of the larger claim because all corroboration is just touch point. I might find your fingerprint in the house, but this doesn't tell me anything about what you did in the house. Now, I can do some things, but not everything. It doesn't tell me anything about what you wore or what you said while you were in the house. I just know you were in the house. That's what touch point corroboration does. Same thing in this kind of a case. Um, so the third thing was, you know, have they changed their story over time or have they been honest and accurate consistently? And the last thing would be, do they possess a bias? These are the things we instruct jurors to look for in eyewitnesses. So that's the only new thing I knew to do was to examine the Gospels like eyewitness accounts. And I think if you did that fairly, and that's always the trick. You know, I don't win my cases in opening statements. I just talking to the DA yesterday who I worked with all my cases and he's getting ready to do the Robert Durst case. That's a very famous case nationally. It starts in about a month. And I, when I just was leaving my job as a cold case detective full time when this case came into his lap. So I've been tracking along with him as he's preparing it for opening statement. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be on YouTube live. This, this case is a nationally known case. It's a cold case. And this is going to be probably a four-hour opening statement. And this is not where we win our cases. We don't win them during the evidence show over the next eight months. We don't win them in closing argument. We don't win them even as we depart and let the jury deliberate. You win your cases in jury selection. Huh. Bad but true. What that means is that your presuppositional biases really determine where you end up. And that's why you and I have a kinship, because we both know it's not just evidence, it's presuppositions. And we have to kind of look at both of these things. And in a case, what we do is we, we look at the presuppositional issues in jury selection, and if we can resolve those so we have people who are open, willing to examine the evidence, well, then we can do the evidential part next. And that's why I always say, yeah, I'm, I'm a presuppositionalist when I'm choosing who I'm going to talk to Jesus about, and then I'm an evidentialist once I actually do start talking. Thank you.